Welcome back to part two of our series where we are creating a Python library that will interact with the TD Ameritrade API. In our last video, so video number one, I tried to give you some context as to my thought process when I was creating this library, kind of what the intent was behind it, and, and really what was I trying to achieve when it came to building this library. Um, again, not too much coding in that video because I think if anybody ever wanted to modify this library, if they ever wanted to kind of say like, hey, what were you doing and why did you do it? Um, I wanted to kind of lay that down so that way people could understand my thought process. And then ideally, as you're looking through the code, you're going like, oh, okay, now I know why he was doing like X, Y, Z. It was because he was trying to do that. So while it might not have been any coding in it, I think it was a really important video to watch. Um, the little code that we did write is basically just setting up our class object and then we defined a special dunder method. So picking up where we left off, the double underscore init method is a basically a special method that belongs to our class. Um, it's special in the sense of it kind of, well, it's basically in the category of dunder methods, but all the dunder methods do is they kind of enrich, that's at least how Python, I guess, likes to describe it. It enriches your class object. So it can do things like create a string representation of your object. It could return the count of a certain item or something like that. Or um, it can do things like iteration. So a lot of different cool things can be defined by Dunder methods. Um, in this particular client object, we're going to be working with two. Um, the first one is the initialization method. And all this is special about the initialization method is you don't have to call it. Anytime you create a new instance of your client object, this method will be called, even if you don't specify it. So that's the really cool thing about this process, this Dunder method is anytime we create a new instance of our TD client object, anything that belongs to this method will run. Well, that's really important because there's a lot of stuff we need to kind of set up before we do things like authenticate ourselves and make an API request. So let's define some of those attributes and methods. To make things go a little bit quicker, I'm just gonna copy some code <laughs> just to make my life easier and not kind of bore you with the typing aspect. So I'll copy it and then we'll go through it. Alrighty. So the first two things that we define in our initialization Dunder method is the configuration dictionary. And then we have something called the endpoint arguments dictionary. So both of these are a dictionary. The configuration dictionary basically defines all the pieces of information that we will probably be using throughout our API at some point. So things like our consumer ID, client ID for other people who thought heard it that way, um, account number, account password, the redirect URI. So these are things that you're going to be passing through. Um, and then there's some other things in here, things like refresh enabled, authentication endpoint, cache state. Um, API version. These are all pieces of information that will either be used during the authentication process or an actual request themselves. So it's important information um, that we might need later down the road. Now, if you kind of see what I'm doing here, um, this dictionary, the key is the key, and then the value is basically pulling the information from my config file. So my config file has all this information in it. You can notice right here that redirect URI, consumer ID, account number, that's all blank. But then you have things like the authentication URL, authentication endpoint, um, API URL, uh, API version, uh, token endpoint. So it's pulling in all this information from my config file and it's basically assigning it to each of the respective keys in the configuration dictionary. Now, I will warn you, if you change all of these to lowercase or you spell them differently, guess what? This will fail. You have to match up with whatever you see over here. So if it's all uppercase account number, guess what? This needs to be all uppercase account number or else you will get an error and it will not work. And if you also notice, I didn't pull in all of them. I just pulled in some of them. Some of these configuration properties I define, you know, in the client myself. Now, technically you could do that with all of this. There's really no reason you even need the authentic, I mean the config file. But just to be consistent with the Microsoft Graph one, I kept it the same because I wanted to make sure it worked and I didn't want to change too much. Um, probably the code you'll see on GitHub, it's probably going to just all be in the configuration dictionary. And I won't even have a config file. So the endpoint arguments. Well, as you all know, um, there are multiple different types of requests that you can make to the TD Ameritrade API. Some of those requests have 
potentially multiple valid arguments. So to give you an idea of how you would read this dictionary, do the following. Hey, with the TD Ameritrade API, there is an endpoint called search instruments. Inside the search instruments endpoint, there is a parameter called projection. Projection can be one of these five values. And if it's not one of those five values, guess what? They pass through a wrong parameter value and you need to raise an error. We will raise those errors further down in a different section of code, but that's all this dictionary is doing is it's gonna help us validate the arguments that were passed through by the user. So that way, if they pass through something that wasn't correct, we can let them know, hey, you just passed through a bad argument. This is probably what you were trying to do if we can't. In some cases, they might've just passed through a really bad argument and I can't even direct them. So um, for example, the get movers endpoint, it has three different param three different name arguments. One is market, one is direction, and one is change. For the markets argument, there are three possible parameter values. If it's not one of those three, it's incorrect. For the direction argument, there's one of two possible values, up or down. And if it's not one of those two values, it's incorrect. And the same for change. So again, all it's doing is it's just validating what the user is passing through. Alrighty, let's go on to the next one. I'm moving my notes, so forgive me. Okay, there it is. Alrighty. So what we're going to do next is we're going to validate all the keyword arguments that were passed through. Now, here's a little trick. The keyword arguments, it's just a dictionary. It's an item and a key. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all the keys and we're going to see if the key is in this dictionary. And if it's not, guess what? It means they passed through a bad one. So that's all this is going to be doing. All right. So we're going to say for key in quarks. Args. I hate saying that word to be honest. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say if key not, so if it's not in the self.config dictionary, then guess what? Print. Yeah, we'll just copy it. <laughs> I'm getting lazy. I'm sorry. I'm sure hopefully you guys can figure out what I'm doing here, but maybe not. So I'm going to print an error and then I'm going to raise a key error value. It's really important I raise that key error value because I don't want them to continue through the process if they just gave me a bad keyword argument. But I'm going to try to give them an idea of which one was bad. So I'm going to say, hey, you passed through an argument that I wasn't expecting and that's an invalid argument name. So now that we've done that, let's try out and see what we get. So as you can tell here, all I'm doing is I'm going to import my TD client object from my TD API file. I'm going to create a new instance of my client object. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass through two named parameters or two named arguments. One is account number and one is account password. So I shouldn't expect any errors in this particular line of code because I notice account number and account password are both in my configuration dictionary. So I should be fine. So let's try it out. Oh, well. Let me save it first and let me save this one. All right. Okay, so there was no errors. It might be kind of hard to tell, but basically nothing happened, which was good because it means everything was fine. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's pass through a bad named argument. So let's pass through a argument called Bob and Bob's gonna have a value of 200. Let's see what happens when that is passed through. <gasps> oh, warning, the argument Bob is an unknown argument. Not good. Key error, invalid argument name. So it worked just like we expected it to. It let the user know, guess what? You pass through a bad argument, no bueno. You need to make sure it is correct. So that's what this section of code is doing, is it's validating, validate the passed through argument keys. Now, it's not going to validate if it's the correct account number or any of that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where this stops. It's not going to say, oh, hey, guess what, John? You just passed through your wrong account number. I don't know your account number, so I can't validate your account number. I could technically validate this stuff, but it has a tendency to change. So I'll kind of debate if I want to go down that path or not. So just keep that in mind. It's not going to validate the value. It's just going to validate the key for you. All right. So the next couple of steps, it might be a little confusing at this point just because we haven't defined the code, but 
we still need to define it because during the initialization process, we still have to call these methods. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to call the state manager method. The state manager method basically manages the state of our client object. More specifically, it manages the session that our client object is kind of running. So uh, when we initialize our state manager, um, we want to um, basically set it to initialized. So set the state manager to initialize. And so we're going to call the self keyword and we're going to do state manager. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do init. So again, doesn't make a lot of sense what this is doing, but trust me, it will. And then there's an additional attribute that I'm not really using anywhere in the code, but I think it's kind of a nice attribute to have, to be honest. So I'm going to kind of leave it here. But just keep in mind, technically, you don't need it. Um, this one is basically defining a new attribute. So it's going to define defining a new attribute called auth state. And so this is basically just saying if you're authenticated or not. It's just literally a string. And so we're going to call the self keyword. We're going to do auth state. And then initially, it's just going to be blank. Because when we initialize, guess what? We aren't authenticated. So it's um, really important that you understand that. Because when we initialize, we are not authenticated. We are only authenticated after we log in. OK. And then from here, um, we pretty much have defined all the steps of our initialization process. So um, we've defined our configuration dictionary, our endpoint arguments. We've validated all the keyword arguments that were passed through. And we also made sure that we set our state manager to initialized. And we've also defined our authentication state as blank. I mean, technically, you could say um, not authenticated if you wanted to be really specific, but you don't have to. OK, so now that we've done that, we're going to define one more Dunder method. And then let me check the time. Yeah, we should be good. Yeah, we should be good. OK, so the second Dunder method is called double underscore repper or ripper. I don't know. This is basically going to define a string representation of my particular client object. So all that means is if I was to wrap my TD session object inside of a print function, it's going to actually produce a readable string. It's not going to be like, hey, object at blah, 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 spot in memory or whatever it is. Um, it's going to do something that's a little bit more readable and user friendly. And so all we're doing is we're going to create that string representation. But I want my string representation to have a couple key different pieces of information, whether they're logged in or not, and then their client ID. Now, technically, the client ID is a little bit sensitive, so you don't have to put it in there. But again, I was kind of following the, you know, the, the Microsoft Gaff one. So the first thing we need to do is grab the login state. Now, we'll define the login state later in the code, but we're going to have a new dictionary called state. And inside that state dictionary, there is going to be a key called logged in. And guess what? If there is a key, it means we're logged in. Then logged in state is equal to true. Because the only time you would have that logged in key is if we were truly logged in. So. Basically, all this is really saying is, hey, if there's a key in the dictionary called logged in, it means you're logged in. Otherwise, guess what? You're not logged in. <laughs> and then um, you would have logged in state equals false. OK. And then from here, we're going to do the We're going to define the string representation. I can't remember. That's bad. OK. And then, shen. can't spell tonight. Uh, and then, we're just going to copy this little guy right here. Oh, no, we'll cut it. Copy. And then, all it's going to do is it's going to create a string called TD Ameritrade Client, logged in, blank, client ID, blank. These are placeholders, so I'm going to call the format function and pass through what I want that to do. So right now, it's going to basically show none, 
but it should work. I do want to make sure I don't have that though, because if I call it, oh yeah, that would kind of fail too. And eh, we'll just temporarily turn it off. When in doubt, just turn it off, right? True. Just for simplicity purposes. Yeah, looks good. Hopefully there's no errors. Well, there's going to be an error unless I get rid of that. Um, so you can you see right here, again, I hope that's easy to read for people. Um, you'll see TD Ameritrade client logged in. True, client ID. It's right now none because guess what? I didn't provide a client ID. So that's all that's doing is it's just basically... Um, uh, cleaning it all up and it's just um, making it a more reader-friendly version, I guess if that's how you want to call it. Okay, you. And then I think, how oh, are we still doing? Okay, good. Sorry, I just don't want to go like too far over and then make people like sit here going crazy. We'll do one more and then we'll call it quits. So the next one that we're going to define is for headers. So obviously a lot of our requests are going to need headers. Um, instead of repeating the process of defining a bunch of stuff, let's just have this information defined up above and then we can just easily call a method and we'll be good to go. So we'll create a new method. This one will be called headers. Now, technically there's a convention. If you want a method to be private inside of a class object, you do a leading underscore. So because technically there's no such thing as a private method inside of Python, so we have to use a naming convention otherwise instead. And so the naming convention is if you see a leading underscore, it means it's private and you really shouldn't access it um, unless you're the person kind of like, you know, internally using the tool or something like that. Um, it's not something that the users really should be accessing. Now, technically you can, but you shouldn't. So in my case, I don't really care if you access headers. It's just going to basically return a headers dictionary to you. Um, you can use it if you want. I mean, maybe if you want to use it somewhere else, by all means, go use it. Um, it's not really a private, but you're going to kind of see I never really use it outside of the actual client object itself. So the first thing we need to do is we need to first grab the access token. Um, the access token will actually live in that state dictionary that we talked about up here. And then all it's going to actually live in is just a key called access token. So we'll create a new variable called token. It's going to equal self.state. And then we do access underscore token. Perfect. And then from here, we're going to create the headers dictionary. Create the headers dictionary. And then it's going to be headers equals authorization. Ooh. And then it's going to be um, F bearer and then brackets token. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yes. Hope that's right. Yes. Sorry, I was getting like all confused looking. Oh, wait, no, sorry. It's not that. It's this one. It's just a placeholder, basically. Um, and then all you want to do is return headers. I can't call this method right now because technically I don't have an access token, but again, really simple. It's just creating a headers dictionary and then it returns it right back to you. So with that being said though, I think I'm going to call it quits on this video. So if you have any questions at this point, feel free to put them down below, whatever you feel is necessary. I'll try to kind of help you through the thought process. And then in our next video, what do we got? API endpoint, and then we're going to do state manager, I think. State manager is a beast. It's a beast of a one, but it's a good one. And then we have the login function as well. I think we'll probably be able to get through login. Yeah, probably login, API endpoint, and then um, state manager. So th those are really what I would say is the crux of like the actual like authentication process. This is just kind of getting us ready for the authentication process, but we're not really doing anything related to authentication. If anything, we're doing things after authentication. So that's what's going to be covered in the next video. So again, if you have any questions,
feel free to put them down below. Otherwise, we will see you in the next video.